So, uh, God is good. <laughs> You're so fast on that. And all the time. <laughs> Amen. And so it's incredibly good news that we have. And we, this year, as we go through 2021, are going to focus on the theme of story. Being God's people in the midst of his story and who he is. And so our theme is story, telling our past, living in the present, and hope for our future with Jesus Christ throughout everything. Because we as a body of Christ are just the people that are together because we love Jesus and we're following him. Plain and simple. And that makes us family. That makes us um, brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's really, really good news. So welcome if you're here visiting with us. We would love to get to know you better and get to, get to share our stories with you as we walk with Christ. And for those of you that are live streaming with us today, welcome. It's a blessing to have you along as well. This morning we're going to talk about the truth that conclusion is really important. If you know the conclusion of a story, it really blesses your understanding, your reading of that story. Last week we talked about the introduction of the story, and we talked about how Mark and Luke technically start with their conclusions. Their conclusion, both of them, is that Jesus is the Messiah, that he's the Lord. Mark's is really quick. It's just one sentence. It's Mark chapter 1, verse 1. This is the beginning of the good news story of Jesus Christ, or the beginning, or the gospel, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But Luke's is a little bit longer. It takes about four verses, where he essentially says, we were told about this in the past through Scripture. We're able to experience it living now and understand, and I, I have eyewitness reports, and that this gives us hope for the future. And he shares that message, that introduction, that concluding introduction, with somebody named Theophilus, which simply means somebody who loves God. And so, if you love God and you're following Jesus, Luke is writing to you. He's writing to you to share this good news story of Jesus. There are some movies that, and other stories and books that I've read that I've really liked because they began with the conclusion. Now, some of you who have never heard somebody talk about a, a story beginning with a conclusion and liking it are probably like, that's, that's a horrible idea that gives away everything. Are you ready for me to, to point one out? And you're like, oh, that is good. Forrest Gump. You remember? Forrest Gump actually ends at the end. Not the complete end of it, but at the end. It's at the conclusion. He's sitting on the bench, and it's right about where his story all leads up to the point where he's going to make a decision and, and go and uh, meet her again, Right? Um, another one, hmm, Saving Private Ryan. Do you remember how that began? For those of you that really like war movies, Save it, Saving Private Ryan was Steven Spielberg's fantastic storytelling job of understanding what many of our soldiers went through in World War II. And the story begins with an older man, the storyteller, the narrator, walking through the cemetery and going to Ryan's, I think it was Ryan's tombstone. No, it's the other guy's tombstones, if I remember right. I'll, I'll have to watch that again. But there's many movies that I really, really like that start off with the conclusion. And the reason why the storytellers do that is this. If you know the conclusion of the story, you are better able to be surprised by the events of the story and to be able to watch the character development that happens. You're able to, since you know what the outcome's going to be, you're able to look at the choices of the character and go, that's really interesting why they decided to do that. And I think that's really important that we recognize the truth as brothers and sisters in Christ, as people who recognize that God is a storyteller, that we recognize that he has told us the conclusion. He's told it plainly. Now there's things about the middle of the story where we're living in that we may have disagreements on, but you cannot disagree with me if you read scripture on what the conclusion is. And the writer of Revelation, John, does it masterfully as he writes Revelation, because what he lets us know, which by the way, for those of you that have studied the Bible recently, oh, yeah, I'll get there in a second, but those of you that have studied the Bible recently know that Revelation is technically a concluding book of the Bible, right? It, it tells us what's soon to take place. It tells us about the last days. It tells us about Jesus coming in and the hope that we have when he comes again, and a bit about the story as we're waiting for him to come again. But have you ever noticed, if you have your Bibles, open up the Revelation chapter 1. John begins with the conclusion. Here's what he says. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all he saw. Blessed is the one who reads the words aloud, the words of this prophecy. I'm getting blessed right now. Blessed are those who hear. You're being blessed right now. And blessed are those who 
who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. And then you flip to the back of the book, and you get these words. These are the last words of God's word. This is the conclusion of all things. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. For some of us, we need grace to find because maybe we haven't heard that word very much and used, and maybe it's good for us just to have a reminder. Here's what grace means. It's a free gift that you do not deserve. You didn't do anything to deserve it, and it's the gift of your sins being forgiven. That's what, the great, that's what grace is. And so the conclusion of Scripture is, may the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. Plain and simple, Scripture concludes with, if you're in Jesus, if you've chosen to follow the storyline of following Jesus, you have grace that covers you. And so since you know the outcome, you know the conclusion, how are you going to live? We've taken it up on my family, and we, we had to start Sunday morning because we were kind of a couple of days behind, but we've been caught up since then of uh, reading the day-by-day -day kids uh, Bible again. You remember that chronological Bible that has the dates separated so you can read through the Bible through a year? We did this about two years ago. My family and I have started doing that again, and uh, this time when we read about the story of Abraham, Evelyn looked at me at the end of that and asked me a really important question. She looked at me. We were sitting on the couch. I remember this because it's just a couple of days ago. I've only slept like twice since then. And she looked me in the eyes and said, Dad, would you sacrifice me? Because we had just gotten done reading Genesis chapter 22, the story of when God tells Abraham to take Isaac up on the mountain and to sacrifice him. And so she looks at me and says, Dad, would you sacrifice me? And this was one of those blessed moments where I actually had a little bit of patience in my life. And I sat there and thought about it. My first response was going to be like, no, Evelyn, I love you, except when you do really horrible things. But no, that was my first response. But then I got to thinking about it, and I looked at her, and I said, yeah, if God asked me to sacrifice you, I would. And she looked at me kind of funny. And I said, that's because I know the conclusion. I know that God wouldn't let me do it because he is willing to sacrifice his son for both of us that we may have life. And she went, oh, okay. And I know she didn't fully get it, but she will more and more as the days come. And this is where we're at as we use the theme of story and help us understand who we are in God's creation and what our walk with Christ is like as we begin to look at and understand that the conclusion is everything. The conclusion helps us to make better choices and help us to realize that we have choices to make as we follow Jesus. And I think this is a powerful truth. So again, if you have your Bibles, we're actually going to start in Genesis chapter 12. We're going to do what Evelyn and I did with the rest of our family. And we're going to watch the truth that God has actually, long before chapter 22 of Genesis, told Abraham the conclusion. And here it is. Genesis chapter 12 begins with the story of the call of Abram. His name as actually a different before that. And the reason for that is, is the call of Abram is that we go back even a little bit further in the story and we see that God is having a problem with people. The problem is this. He tells them what to do and tells them to be in relationship with them and then they mess it up really bad. And so they messed it up so bad that a flood came in Genesis chapter 6. God actually fl decided to flood the world because he wanted to start over. And really, if you read Genesis there, you realize that he was actually pretty upset and wanted to be done. But he remembered Noah and remembered Noah and his righteousness and his trusting of God. So he saves Noah and his family, and they get off the ark, and almost immediately sin enters into the picture once again. And then in chapter 11, Genesis, all the people that are alive after several years after Noah have been, have been thinking that they could become gods again, which is really the sin of Adam and Eve. That's what the serpent was tempting them towards. And so you have this whole problem. So God decides he's got a plan that's much different than flooding everything and changing everything. It's to give a conclusion. Watch this. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one that dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Do you notice the conclusion in there? He's going to have kids, and they're going to be blessing. 
and everybody else is going to be blessed except those that don't want to be blessed. That's the conclusion. That's what Abraham has promised. And you'll notice over and over again, chapter 15, I think it's even in 13, chapter 17 and chapter 22, over and over again, chapter 14, God tells them, this is what the blessing, this is what the conclusion is. Walk, walk through Genesis with me real quick. So Abram, for some reason, after he gets his land of promise, decides to venture over to Egypt. And Genesis tells us, but I'll let you read that later on. And he knows his wife is pretty. So when he gets to Egypt, he tells the king there that this is my sister, which, by the way, weirdly, and Evelyn and I had to discuss this as well. She is his half-sister. Let, let's not practice that. that. That's not what Jesus has called us to, by the way. So, it, because he's nervous that the king's going to kill him in order to take his wife, because back in those days, that's what people did. It's not unsimilar still. But anyways, so... <laughs> They find, he, the king finds out because he's basically being cursed that this is what's going on. God tells him. And so the blessings end up coming because he blesses, uh, he blesses Abraham and gives Sarah back. You continue on, you find out about Abram and Lot and about how they separate. And Lot goes to, or towards the city of Sodom and lives over there because their, their goats and their sheep herds are way too big to live together. Well, while Lot is over there, chapter 14, um, some kings come and attack Sodom and Gomorrah. And in that, they end up attacking Lot and they capture them and take them away. Abraham here, well, I'm sorry, it's still Abram. Abram hears about it and Abram ends up getting a little small army together of like 380 some odd people. And they go and they destroy the other kings and get everything back. And then this king that shows up out of nowhere from, from uh, um, Salem, which means peace, shalom. This king of peace shows up and his name is Melchizedek. And Abram gives him a tenth of everything, and Melchizedek blesses him. And again says that you're going to be a blessing. The conclusion is that there's going to be blessings. So we get into chapter 15, and God makes a covenant with Abram and continues on with that covenant of you will have many children. They'll be as numerous as the sand of the sea shore and as numerous as the stars up in the sky, and that there's going to be the blessing. So Sarah ends up trying to intercede with this in chapter 16. She's like, we're getting old. We're not having kids here. I got to do something about this. So she gives Abraham her maidservant, which by the way, I wouldn't encourage that either because that's not very wise, and uh, gives her to um, Abraham, and they end up having a son named Ishmael, which means God hears. And so we continue on. We keep finding out that Abraham is blessed, but God still got a conclusion that's a whole lot better. So they continue. And so chapter 17, the covenant of circumcision. And then Isaac's birth is promised. Three angels show up to Abraham's house, and they meet outside of the house, and they say, hey, you're going to have a son. And it's going to be the actual son of the conclusion promise. Not, not Ishmael. He's not going to receive that. And Sarah's cooking in the kitchen inside the tent, and she hears it and laughs out loud because they're old. If I remember right, they're in their upper 90s, right? They're old. And so Sarah laughs about it, but then they, she actually conceives. And so Abraham ends up interceding for Sodom whenever God decides to destroy so, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. And then Lot is rescued from Sodom, chapter 19, and runs away. And his wife becomes a pillar of salt because she doesn't trust in God's conclusions, by the way. Did you notice that? And then God destroys Sodom, and that's where the whole wife thing. Chapter 20, Abraham does this really dumb uh, thing once again. By the way, Sarah must have been beautiful as an older lady. <laughs> Because Abimelech wants to marry her because she's pretty. And remember, she's already older. And so uh, Abraham's like, well, this is my sister. And then the whole cursing, blessing thing exchange happens once again. By the way, it's a story that happens again with Isaac. We, we'll talk about that another time. But then Isaac is born, chapter 21. So God decides to send Hagar and Ishmael away because Hagar and Ishmael are really struggling with Sarah. And that, that, that familial problem that's happening there because of the, the weird relationship, one would almost say the broken relationship that happened because she wasn't trusting God's conclusion. And then you get into chapter 22, and these words start. And I'm going to read it, and I want you to keep in mind that knowing the conclusion really helps us to make right choices and to live more courageous and loving lives in God's story. And I still find it amazing that God gives us the ability to choose. So let me read this and we'll see if you notice it. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham! And he said, here am I. By the way, who, Moses, as he writes the book of Genesis, um, is really good at keeping themes. Notice the theme of here am I over and over again in this text. 
So God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled up his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. So on the third day, after they'd been camping out for a bit, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to the two young men that were helping them out, Stay here with the donkey, I and the boy. I mean, sometimes I call my son the boy, and I've heard some of you dads doing that as well. I, I, I guess it's pretty a common occurrence between dads and their sons. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And by the way, don't get too far ahead in the story when you read that. It just means that he gave Isaac a wooden backpack to carry up the mountain, to carry all that wood laid it on his son, on the back of his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. <laughs> I didn't think about this before, but man, he's looking a whole lot like uh, Rambo <laughs> going up here. He's got a torch in one hand, a knife in the other hand, and he, he's taken his son up this mountain. So they both of them, they went both of them together. And Isaac, who was probably about somewhere between 12 and 13 at this time, said to his father, said to Abraham, my father. And he said, here am I, my son. And he said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said to him, and keep in mind, Abraham knows the conclusion. It's been told to him over and over and over again. It's been proven to him over and over again that the conclusion's real. God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they both of them went together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. If he's anything like my son Caden, that must have been quite a chore. Then <laughs> Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. So he's, he's in the process of the downstroke of the knife. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And the angel said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his thorns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide, or Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Did you notice how Abraham trusted in the conclusion that's been told to him all along of the promise of God, what's going to happen? God told him, you will be a father. And by the way, when his name changes from Abram, which means father to Abraham, which is the father of nations or father of a nation, God tells him over and over again that he's going to have lots of kids. And yet he only has one. And what does God ask of him to do? It sounds like God's asking him to lose that son, to sacrifice him. There's only two thoughts I think Abraham could have had during that moment as he's there getting ready to draw that knife and to drop it. And if he believes in the conclusion, it's this. One, God's going to stop him because God's got a plan. He's been promising me over and over again. Or two, if he does take Isaac and sacrifice him, that God can bring him back. Or maybe even three. I didn't think about this earlier, but maybe, maybe there's another son. But he had already told Abraham that Isaac was the son of the promise, that was going to receive that promise. So really only one and two can really play out in his mind. And notice how much he trusted in the conclusion. He was willing to pack up, willing to get his, the, the two young men and his son to go out and go camping and travel really far distance. By the way, we're almost certain this is Mount Sinai. They go out there and he camps for three days. I'm sure he had to do some hunting to sustain the meat that they might need because a donkey may not have been able to carry that amount. And he, he's, he's not doing all the work at home. He's leaving all his flocks and his herds. For those of you that have animals, you know that you can leave them for some time, but you can't leave them for that long. You may be worrying about that. But he knows the conclusion. He knows the hope that he has that God will fulfill his promises. And so he's willing to take Isaac up there on that mountain, and he's willing to trust in the Lord. We've been told the conclusion of our lives. May 
the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. That's the conclusion. What you have as living in God's story is the choice of if you're going to choose to believe in that conclusion or not. And there are going to be times that it's hard to believe in that conclusion. And Abraham is a fantastic example that it is hard to believe in the conclusion. Both times he goes to other king's places, like in Egypt or to Abimelech, what does he do? He says, she's my sister. And almost loses his wife, who would have been the conclusion, the part, of, part of the conclusion of the promise of having a great nation. Because without a wife, you can't have kids, Right? For those of you that don't know the birds and the bees yet, well, you can talk to your parents about that another time, right? And so what goes on there in that story is that you find out at the end of it, as God finally blesses him once again, because chapter 22 ends with this amazing, beautiful, articulate, poetic blessing that God gives them, is that he really believes in the conclusion, even though he's messed up on it a couple of times. And that gift of grace that you and I get because of Jesus Christ should call us out and the choices that we make as we live the stories that we live. By the way, you're going to get tired of this this year, but I'm going to say it over and over again. A story is a character who wants something and overcomes conflict to get it. It's that simple. If there's no conflict, there's no story. If the character doesn't want anything, there's no story. It's a character who wants something and overcomes conflict to get it. If you're following Jesus, what do you want? You want to follow him. You want to be with him. Guess what's going to happen if we live stories? There's going to be conflict. Do you trust in the conclusion? I know for many of us, this week has been a hard week. This this last year has been a hard year. Do you trust in the conclusion that the grace of Jesus will be with us all? Because that helps us to live better stories. That helps us to respond to news, to, to personal tragedy, to comedy, whatever it is going on in our lives, a whole lot better and a whole lot differently than the world would have us choose. The world would have us hide and to make up things and to say things like, I hope you never have to say this, she's, my, she's just my sister, <laughs> like Abraham did, we, where, we, where we make up false stories in order to not live into the real story that we've been called into. By the way, she was his half-sister. It's kind of half-false, whatever. You can deal with that on your own. So that being said, I want you to notice this verse that Paul shares with the church in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. He's been talking about Jesus. He's been talking about how how Jesus was predestined to save us. This is chapter one. He's been talking about how we're sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. He's been talking about all this knowledge and goodness of the mystery of Christ, of how we know even people that aren't Jewish know that there is salvation and goodness and rightness in this world. And he says this, for by grace, by the conclusion, you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, meaning that you didn't get it because of anything that you did, It is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. And if we stop reading there, we can be like, oh, well, it's his decision. I don't really have a choice in this. I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. It doesn't matter what my story is and the choices that I make in my story. But look at the next, next part of the verse, the next words. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Some of the stories that we enter into, and I wonder if it's all of the stories, I don't know because I'm not God. The choices that we make are choices where God is testing us and saying, are you, re- are you living into the conclusion? Do you really trust that what I've told you is going to happen? That there is salvation for those that follow the Lamb, that there is grace that covers over all of your sins, not just a multitude of sins, all of your sins and that you can make better choices and live a much more profound story than you would live without God. That's what Paul is calling the the church in Ephesus out to here in these verses, and that's what John is reminding us in Revelation. It's what Mark and Luke are hoping that we get as they tell the good news story of Jesus, and that's who we are going to be in search as we go through this theme of story throughout this year. Do we believe the conclusion? And if we do believe, how much better are the choices are that we're going to make. Now, trust me, some of these choices are going to be courageous. They're going to be hard choices to make. It's going to be very difficult because a story is a character who wants something and overcomes conflict to get it. But it's going to be worth it because you're God's workmanship. God created you to tell a good story. It doesn't matter if it's a short story, if it's a long story, it's a good story if you trust in God and you follow him and you live 
for the conclusion that Jesus saves. So brothers and sisters, I encourage you, let's share our stories this year because we're all going to have different stories. It's, we're not all Abraham or Sarah's. We're, we're all different. And God has called us out to live different stories. And it's about the choices we make. One of the amazing parts about God is he loves us so much that he doesn't choose for us because he's given us the permission to choose to love him and to, to make that decision. He's not forcing you to love him and to choose story. We get to choose. And if we live with the conclusion in mind that the grace of Lord Jesus be with everyone, we're going to make much better choices in our life. We're going to live much better stories. And we're going to share those stories together. Because it's, in, because it's in sharing those stories that we recognize that we've been called as one church, as one family of God, and togetherness looking towards that one conclusion that the grace of Jesus Christ may be with you all. If you need to follow Jesus, the way, is, the way is clear. It's in Scripture. It's really simple. If you believe in him, that he is the Son of God, and that he was here about 2,000 years ago, and that he died and gave his life that you may have life, that that conclusion may be real, follow him in baptism. <laughs> he actually tells the story that you should follow him in baptism by being baptized. He joins us in our humanity. When he had no sin, he was baptized for the remission of sin, even though he did not need to be. And he joined us, and God said, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased, because he joins our story. Follow him. Follow him in baptism. Trust him, and, and live in the newness of life. And I promise you, it's going to be a good story. It'll be challenging. It will take courage. But God said, be strong and courageous and don't be afraid because I'm always with you. And if you need prayer for anything, that's part of story. It's part of talking to God about what's going on and the choices that we're making and the difficulty of it. And God says, cry out to me and I'm there. I'm right there with you. We, we need to be people who pray with and for each other because we're living in the story. We need to encourage each other in focusing on that conclusion. May the grace of Lord Jesus be with you all. I pray the Lord bless you and keep you. I pray the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And I pray God turn his face, lift his countenance to you, and give you peace, give you that shalom that Melchizedek brought to, brought to Abraham as Abraham believed in the conclusion, in the, in the end of the story.